Welcome to episode 157 of the Ski Podcast and thanks for joining us today. We're going to be turning our focus to snowboarding today, looking at how to choose a snowboard, whether you should buy or rent, and we'll be looking at splitboarding too. My name is Ian Martin. I'd like to introduce my guest today. I'm delighted to introduce two first-timers. Firstly, journalist Sam Haddad. You might recognise her name as she's been writing uh, for The Guardian for over 10 years. Hi, Sam. How are you? Hi, Ian. Yeah, not too bad. Thank you. Whereabouts are you today? I am very near you. Um, I'm on the (laughs) south coast. um, Yeah, Brighton and Hove. Pretty windy. Um, I was hoping to get in the surf later, but um, I don't know. It's quite windy. Right. Okay. Can you actually see see the sea from where you're sitting then? Um, No, no, just the trees. I can just see what the wind's doing. Um, Yeah, yeah. You saw me look out the window. No. Okay. But I I guess I'm a bit like you. I'm often looking at magic seaweed, but for me, I want it to be flat because I like paddleboarding rather than the surfing. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Different. (laughs) Uh, We're also joined today by uh, Luke Reese, uh, founder of AWE365, or uh, as I understood it was until uh, the other day when Luke told me, or 365. Five is a site full of awesome travel adventures uh, from around the world. How are you doing, Luke? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Thanks. I'm good. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Um, it is AWE three six five, but also also or yeah, yeah. It's uh, air, water, earth. So it's uh, the elements we need to have the adventures that that we all love, basically. Yeah, well, I, I did. I have a quick look through uh, the site because I've seen lots of the blog posts before about uh, different ski resorts and things like that. But I noticed that uh, one of the activities you include in there, I think, is the heli jump uh, that we featured in episode 98 uh, when Felix Milnes went on the heli jump above the Eiger. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I um, well, I did that last winter as well, actually. Um, did yeah, you? So- right absolutely awesome experience yeah it's uh, well well listeners incredible. you can find out what felix thought about it in episode uh, uh, 98 uh, sam i just wanted to have a quick chat to you as well i know i mentioned that you've written for the guardian also for cooler magazine but um i saw that you're starting a new sub stack yeah i started a new it's called um climate and board sports um and the idea was it was yeah basically my three favorite things um snowboarding surfing and worrying about the planet um which I know is something that you you kind of relate well to as well yeah and I just wanted to interview people just about the experience of of kind of living and doing the sports that we love in this sort of changing climate so rather than necessarily focus on the doom or or even solutions although I will include that as well um to just yeah speak to different people around the world you know ski resorts but also kind of you know surf destinations um yeah just about how they're they're feeling and yeah well i've signed i've signed up for it already and i'll put a link into the show notes we'll be touching on sustainability later in the show but let me start with a a question i ask all of my guests on the show sam when were you last on snow do you know what i only it was actually february half term i was in la rosiere um with the family um which is a resort that i really really like um because it's high Um, It's not busy, even in sort of school holidays, which feels like the Holy Grail, um, as I'm sort of stuck like you to some traveling at those times. Um, Yeah, I really, really like that resort. I love that you can kind of go to Italy. I love the views um, on the backside. I love the fact that you can find powder quite easily. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of free riders there. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of La Rosia, and we took our kids there for I think their first three ski holidays. Brilliant uh, area for kids to learn to ski, but also yeah. for the adults while they're in ski school. Although it was a bit of a challenge to kind of get over to Latwil and back, and back while yeah. they're in ski school. Uh, you can go over to there, and they also have that brilliant area called uh, Mont Valaison. I think yeah. it's called the free ride yeah. area, which is relatively new that they introduced a few years ago. Nice and steep. Yeah, really, really enjoyed that. We um. I mean, speaking of the whole kind of climate crisis, but we we basically had some lovely powder days and then it rained really high. And that was just kind of a reminder of of just, yeah, how, how we sort of live these days. But the, but the pleasure of those powder days were amazing. Yeah, <laughs> Excellent. And Luke, what about you? When was the first, uh, last time, excuse me, you were on snow? <laughs> um, <clears throat> at the end of March, I was in North Macedonia, uh, cat skiing, well, snowboarding for me, um, in the Shah Mountains with a great company called Shah Outdoors. Uh, it was absolutely an incredible experience. 
Right. Okay. It sounds like we'll need to get you back on the show to uh, talk about that one. It would actually fit in quite well. I was going to move on to the National Snow Show, which is coming up later this month on the 15th and 16th of October. We're doing a session called the Ski Podcast Live on one of the stages there. And we're looking at off the beaten track. So we're going to be discussing uh, Morocco, Turkey, Uzbekistan and Albania. But I do really enjoy uh, finding out more about other areas. And Macedonia would definitely be uh, one of those. Uh, But yeah, we'll definitely have you uh, back on the show to talk about that uh, at some point and just on the on the subject of the national snow show on the sunday i'm doing a presentation about uh, driving to the alps and electric vehicles the uh, practicalities of that and uh, you know how that comes out and uh, i'm really looking forward to doing that i should also mention uh, this is episode 157 now the reason uh, that uh, that we've jumped up to that number is because of the comment that we had about uh, from uh, one of our listeners jules uh, the other week we have all these extra episodes and I decided just to roll them into one. So from now on, our new taxonomy is we're 157 onwards. That's how many episodes of the show there are. Also, just want to chip in at this point. We had some good snow um, last month, right at the end of September. Um, although a lot of that has kind of melted away uh, lower down, you know, the tops of the mountains are looking white. And what is really encouraging is that a lot of the glaciers that were closed uh, have opened again. I see that uh, actually today, the day we're recording, which is Friday the uh, 7th, uh, of October, Sasfe is opening for the public again. Zermatt is open. They all go uh, for their World Cup races at the end of this month, uh, as is Solden, which is open. So all of that is very encouraging. And thinking about racing, I just wanted to mention uh, the Three Valleys. Uh, as listener, you may know, are the sponsor of the ski podcast. Uh, it is the largest ski area in the world. And in February, the World Alpine Ski Championships are coming to the area. Uh, we're going to be covering that in a bit more detail later on. But I just wanted to flag that. All of the men's events are going to take place in Courcheval. All the women's events are going to take place in Meribel. It's between the 6th and the 19th of February. Now, that kind of crosses over with uh, with half-term week uh, anyway, as, uh, as Sam mentioned before. I wouldn't be put off by that. It actually can be quite a good time to go out uh, if there's a big event going on, because you find that a lot of the people who are in resort aren't actually skiing around and you can get access uh, to all the normal ski areas uh, most of the slopes that are closed aren't normally open to the public uh, anyway uh, so we'll look at that in more detail in in due course but today i'd like to discuss snowboarding a little bit more and that's why i asked sam and luke uh, to come on the show i'm not a snowboarder you both are snowboarders um, and therefore we don't really know we don't really have so much coverage on it and uh, we definitely had comments from listeners when I did the questionnaire about having more uh, snowboard uh, chat so I thought I'd start off asking you Luke if I could as a first board buyer where should I start you know what would your advice be in that respect first up I would say uh, try snowboarding first and um, before you buy a board because yeah, there's a chance you might not like it. I mean, I think you'd be crazy if you didn't. But you know, there are people I know who've tried it, haven't liked it, and have gone skiing. Um, you know, obviously I don't talk to them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but no, it's try it first, and then um, depending on your budget, the first thing to buy is boots before you buy a board. That's the most important thing. Um, but if you're ready to buy a board, um, then I guess I mean the, the first thing is there's, there's not really any particular beginner board um there's boards that are better for beginners and there's boards that are better for experienced riders there aren't really beginner snowboards the most important thing is to get a board that's the right size for your your weight um and every board will have a scale of uh of weight range that it's that it's useful for and if you're on the lower end of that scale so if you're a bit light for that board then the board will be um is a little bit less less good for beginner whereas you're heavier for the board so the board's a bit small for you uh, slightly small for you it makes it a bit easier to turn um and uh um and, and control so it's a bit better for beginners so are you saying then that as a beginner it'd be better to err on the side of caution and get a slightly shorter board is that what you're saying yes you get one within your your size range but shorter within your range than longer a longer board is um is slightly harder to control yeah and in relation to boots you know, when I snowboarded, which was a long time ago uh, now, I, I snowboarded in my ski boots on an alpine snowboard, which I'm pretty sure, uh, does that even exist anymore? That sort of thing is everybody in soft boots. Um, no, there, there are still some people in hard boots. Um, and it's particularly with, um, I think there's a, quite a few split boarders use hard boots. Um, they use the, the kind of um, 
the specific uh, free ride uh, ski touring boots and they customize them to snowboarding. But most people, most snowboarders are in soft boots. To answer that point at the Olympics, um, you know, when you sort of see the Super G and stuff like that, they, they still wear, you know, that kind of carving. Like it, it always makes me think of snowboarding in the 90s. <laughs> well that's what I was doing <laughs> yeah 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 exactly no I was just going to say you know I suppose on the women's side um you know now the the range of boards that you can get you know as a woman snowboarder is so much better than it was before it used to be you know the whole a, a couple kind of per range and they'd often just be kind of a pink version um a slightly smaller version um of the, of the men's boards but but now there is a lot of range just for the fact that that women of often kind of way way less and um, right. less okay. tall so so that's so that's quite interesting sam so in terms of like women's snowboards apart from the fact that originally they were just slightly different designs and they're more likely to be uh pink is there a you know a difference there or is it really just a matter of height and weight and adjusting like that yeah i mean women's feet are, are generally smaller than men's so often they'll be less wide um and you'll be looking for a shorter board um as well and i suppose the stiffness i think because women as a rule, you know, generalizing, of course, uh, um, a less heavy, um, you perhaps wouldn't need such a stiff board, you'd get more response um, from a slightly softer board. And I think in, in the early days, it was this sort of idea that women charged harder. But um, I think if you look at, you know, any number of sort of female professional snowboarders, um, you know, Cheryl Mass, um, Spencer O'Brien, Mary France, Roy, they're all charging really hard. So I think that that that's probably, you know, one of those old stereotypes that we, we've sort of put to bed um, these days. OK. And Luke, can I come back to you then? So you're talking there about, you know, first time border buyer. What if you're like a once a year border? Do you feel that, uh, you know, you sh- that's the point that you should be investing in getting your own snowboard? Or do you think it, it's uh, better to wait until you uh, are doing it more often? But yeah, I, I personally think it's worth investing in a board. Um, I mean, there's a lot of other things to consider when you're getting a board for beginners as well, not just your size. Um, I mean, Sam touched on your height. So if you are particularly tall or particularly short, uh, then it affects what board you should get. Um, and also uh, your, your foot size. If you've got large feet, then you need to be careful you, you aren't going to have overhang. So if your feet hang over the edge of the board, they can drag in the snow. So there's quite a few other things to consider. But yeah, yeah to, to answer your question, um, yeah, I started out as a, a once a year kind of snowboarder. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, mean, I didn't buy one until I did a season somewhere. Um, but I would have bought one that year anyway, I think, just because it it seems to financially make sense. And, and the snowboards are quite personal to you. Everyone has their favourites. And it's not quite so easy to get good good snowboard rental snowboards as it is to get uh really good skis i don't think right i mean that's an interesting question i'd like to come on to that a little bit later just in in relation to uh to buying i'm pretty sure i know the answer to this question but with skis you have on piece skis all mountain skis uh backcountry uh skis etc the the snowboards categorize like that as well they do yeah you get uh you kind of get three kind of categories of snowboards really so you get free ride freestyle and all mountain and all mountain are to cover everything um and those three styles correspond with the shapes of boards so you get directional boards which are good for free ride so they're the powered boards where they're very obviously a different shape uh you get twin boards which are the same shape front and back um and you get true twin boards which are completely the same shape whereas the just twin normally the bindings are set back a little bit so they're more for all mountain whereas the true twin are our are, are freestyle boards now i've got a key question for both of you i'll start with you sam you're both uh, regular snowboarders how many snowboards have you got in your quiver then hmm. do you know what i think i have only got about four i'm very like loyal to my i've still wear my salomon snowboard boots that i did my season in chamonix in 2001 because partly because they're so soft that whenever i try anything else it, it kind of doesn't feel right but um yeah, I'm quite a creature of habit. And I suppose, I don't know, again, there is a slight environmental point to buying kit you don't need. I feel at my level, yeah, I don't know that it makes lo- loads sort of difference. I know that snowboard manufacturers will pro- probably hate hate me sort of saying that. But um, yeah, but a, a split board and pretty much um, I've kind of got a Roxy, is it a rocker board? Yeah, that's what I tend to kind of ride. And when you go away on holiday, how many of them do you take with you? And do you take all four of them with you? Given the choice, I'd take a snowboard and a splitboard, but my husband generally will only let me take one. Um, I mean, if you're if you're flying, there's a massive weight issue, but often we we drive 
and so then you could fit sort of both in but um yeah flying it costs a lot and, and and you wouldn't get both of i wouldn't get both of them in and not have to pay for right so you can't put for example two snowboards in one snowball bag and just pay one ski carriage fee as such not an easy jet <laughs> right it would okay. it would weigh too much well it's right. okay if you were if you were putting other stuff in that board bag my, my, i've got one of those board bags where you can also put your kit on top it yep. would be it would be very difficult um to get it in and that's partly because my split board is a bit older so that weighs a bit more yeah okay so just on the weight from the weight point of view and mm. luke uh, then how many snowboards are you currently owning I'm I'm not 100 percent sure. There's <laughs> more than 10. <laughs> so, Blimey. Okay. Um, but part of that is because I do uh, some board testing, and at the end of, uh, uh, I sometimes then get to take a board board with me after you know it's been tested by a number of people. Yeah, I've got quite a few, um, and I've got a few stored in at my friends in Geneva in Switzerland, um, so that I can avoid flying out with stuff um, when I'm going on going on trips with him. But yeah, I normally. Uh, go back to the question you asked Sam I would normally take two boards away with me on any trip depending on the conditions I would take if it's if it doesn't look oh it's going to be fresh snow I'll take a an all mountain board and a freestyle board and if there is going to be fresh snow I'll take an all mountain board and a powder board so I can cover both bases basically okay well it sounds you've got every base uh, uh, covered there <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Sam you mentioned split boarding mm. I think probably our listeners uh, are aware of that but I wondered if you'd like to just explain what split boarding uh, is yeah I mean split boarding is basically a split snowboard um, it splits into two and then each half um, becomes like a touring ski so in effect um, you add skins to the bottom as you would with um, a pair of touring skis um, and your bindings, I, again, I've got some quite old um, Voile bindings where where I kind of adjust them. The, the modern ones like Karkaram are, are really, really good brands. They're really quick and easy to sort of um, change over. And so then, yeah, then you're ready. Off you go, hike up the mountain. With split boarding then, is there a lot of uh, performance with the actual board? You know, it feels like if you've got a snowboard and you've cut it down the middle, it can't possibly perform in the same way. Yeah, no, I, I would say no now. In the beginning, there was. They were very rigid. And so especially when you'd hiked up and your legs were a bit wobbly and then you those first turns always felt like, oh, this is a very stiff board. But the modern boards, um, I was riding a Jones last year and um, not not at all, I would say. In fact, I've actually ridden – Jones split boards are so good that I've ridden a split board just as my regular board um, on a trip when I was testing them and it was nicer than my regular board. It was really floaty in the powder. So I think the tech, the tech has come on so much, it's – it's such a sort of popular thing to do now that, that I would actually say minimal. Before, if you if you thought you were going to do a bit of split boarding and you could only afford one board, I, I would even go as far as saying it's worth worth getting a split board. Right. Okay. And Luke got a lot of uh, snowboards. Some of them are out in the Alps already, which sounds like a very good way of uh, going about it. But a lot of people, you know, aren't going to own a snowboard. It, it, you can rent. I know you said the choice of snowboards isn't you know, as good, but you can rent snowboards uh, out there. Have you got any views on? on renting versus buying obviously i have quite a i've got quite a quiver so i i, I like boards for different reasons and I, i'm a strong believer in whatever board you ride you you learn how to ride it and you'll enjoy it so actually just quickly going back to the buying the snowboard if you do buy a snowboard whatever you buy you will probably learn to love um and it's the same when you hire a board you know they're, they're different to your normal board my problem is that i've I've found the sizes and the different profiles you can have with boards and shapes, uh, they don't have enough variety. So I've not been able to get exactly what I want for the conditions. Um, they are, the higher boards are more leaning towards kind of the beginner style. So if you are new to it, you'll be able to get a board that's suitable for you. Um, but if you want to get a, a powder board or, or something specific for freestyle, then, you know, it's very hard. I mean, there's, there's shops like one in Morsey called Woods where they they rent out you know great boards by Jones and all sorts. I've I've struggled to be honest when I've when I've had higher boards. And uh, Sam, I'd like to come back to you on that. And also a question in relation to kids. You said you've been out with your kids. I wondered whether kids should ski or snowboard. If you have a view on that and on the rental side of things as well. Yeah, I mean, just quickly on the rent, I was going to say um, it just depends where you're going is what I would sort of think. If you're going to a resort that is known for snowboarding, so Les Arc, uh, Morzine, um, to an extent, I suppose, Chamonix, if you know that they're going to have big intersports or, or other sort of 
big rental shops there, then I think you're fine. If you're going somewhere that's a smaller resort in, in the Alps, and certainly if you're going Eastern Europe, I've had awful experience with rental boards in Serbia um, and Slovenia. But I think, I think yeah, so depend, that depends on where you're going. As for kids and snowboarding, my husband skis and I snowboard. So we did actually start them on skis because I think now that I've got more into splitboarding and touring, I've often wished that I could sometimes have a few more of those um, ski skills. But mine, my now, my eldest is 12. The youngest is 10. They're, they're getting into skateboarding. So I think they're now asking a lot more, you know, when can we snowboard? When? And I'm really, I've been really excited. I'm waiting kind of with glee for <laughs> these, these times for that, that reason. Uh, excellent okay so that actually kind of brings me on to another question you sort of like referred to it before Luke about your friends who uh, you know were snowboarders and now skiers etc there's a kind of cliche that's been knocking around for years that skiers and snowboarders you know you have this enmity uh, between them does that actually exist anymore is that a real thing um well I would say some of my best snowboarding buddies are skiers so um for me no uh it's still as a as a, a joke, a laugh between you, you obviously you know, take the mickey out of each other and uh, and have a laugh about it. If there's just one guy on skis, then he'll have the piss rips out of him for that week. And likewise, if I'm the only snowboarder, they'll probably uh, yeah give me a bit of stick for having to sit down, etc. So, but it's just for fun. It's not. <laughs> yeah, I don't okay. think it's serious within my group. It's not serious. Uh, Sam, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I was going to say it's more just about mountain stoke, loving the mountain, and and to me. Yeah, it's just about kind of who can get down the kind of steepest and most fun things. Um, in terms of it used to be the case that people said when you got older, when you kind of in later middle age, that snowboarders would go back to skiers. And I have got some friends um, sort of saying that at the moment. And I have no truck with that debate at all. Um, I'm still snowboarding, still planning to snowboard as, as long as I can still walk. Um, and there are bindings now. I don't know if you've seen that Burton have a step on binding and Nidecker have now released a binding that's compatible with all snowboard boots. And you basically don't have to bend out. I, I don't really mind the bending down, putting my things on, but I know some people don't like that. And so now you can literally just step into it. Excellent. That, that puts that to bed. Excellent. Well, you know, I do think it's such a tedious uh, cliche that gets rolled out by people who don't really understand anything about the situation. A love of the mountain is universal uh, amongst us all. Um, OK, that's re- that's brilliant, Sam and Luke. Thanks very much for that. I just want to uh, now uh, drop in uh, a short interview I did uh, early this week. In fact, I did it yesterday with um, Alan. Al Judge in Morzine. Uh, regular listeners will know uh, Al. He's a key player in the uh, Montan Vert organization over there, and he's appeared on the podcast before in our electric vehicles uh, special. But I wanted to speak to him about some of the changes uh, they've made in his own company, Alicat Shally Holidays. Let's have a listen to that. Great. I'm delighted to be joined today by Al Judge from Alicat's Mountain Chalets in Morzine. Hi, Al. How are you today? Very good, Ian. Thanks. How are you? Uh, very good. It's great to have you back on the show before. We've had you on a few times uh, in your role uh, with Montan Vert, the extremely uh, good sustainability organisation in Morzine. But today I wanted to talk to you about Alley Cats and some of the measures that you've brought in for sustainability in relation to your own uh, operation. I know you've always been you know, very forward thinking uh, in this. So I noticed that uh, Alley Cats achieved zero food waste last year. And that's a really difficult thing to do when you're running chalets. If you're cooking for 8, 10, 12 people, it's so hard to kind of get the quantities right. So I wondered how you have gone about achieving that uh, zero food waste. Yeah, so we kind of take a, a kind of a holistic approach to the way that we manage food. So we have a permaculture garden here, um, which where we grow as much food as we can. Obviously, it's tricky in the winter. Um but what we also have in, in, as part of that is a, um, a composting system. Uh, and part of our composting approach includes bakashi, which is, allows us to anaerobically break down any food products, which includes meat, cheese, dairy. And what that means is that all of the food waste that comes out of the chalets goes into this bakashi, these bakashi bins, along with some yeast. It breaks it down and then we add it to the compost and then the compost gets added back into the garden from where we then continue to grow things. So that allows us a, a completely um, zero waste circular food system. And it's been really important to us. Excellent. And you've also uh, have your own chickens as well. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the other part of it. So we have our own chickens. They will eat um, a good amount. Um, they often eat uh, leftover baguettes from breakfast in the morning. Uh, and that, that's, the, that's the second part of allowing us to get to zero food waste. 
Excellent. And you're waste neutral overall. So that sounds a lot more uh, difficult to achieve than composting your food. How does that work? So waste neutral is, is similar to the uh, concept of, of carbon neutral. Um, basically, we work with a partner called New Cycle. And what we do is we offset. Uh, we, first of all, we m- measure all the waste that we create. Then we uh, offset. We try and reduce it. And then we offset what we can't reduce. And the partner new cycle they then work in initiatives that take waste out of the environment so the idea is at the end of it we have taken as much waste out of it of the environment as we put in in the first place yeah i know i i will put a link to that in the show notes that sounds like an interesting way of going about things and um, i know that you've got a couple of electric vehicles as well because i was asking you uh, uh, for your input about uh, an article i'm writing uh, the other day use those around the resort yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, mostly they are kind of moving for uh, just moving stuff up and down the resort. Yeah. How have you found their performance in cold weather? Uh, absolutely no problems. Um, to be honest, we never get anywhere near um, testing the, the full range. Um, you know, we charge it each night and for what we need each day, it's absolutely fine. Um, I also noticed that you're kind of reducing the or you said that you're reducing the amount of uh, uh, meat served. And in fact, I think you're offering a discount for clients who choose to have a plant based diet for the week. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. It's part of an overall kind of um, green incentive package. So if you travel to the resort via train and you opt out of the uh, using a hot tub for the week, which is a pretty um, energy hungry thing to to have going and you also eat plant-based then you can enjoy somewhere between 10 and 20 percent off it will always be a minimum of 10 percent and maybe up to 20 percent in certain weeks of the year okay and so if you were not vegetarian or vegan for example will there always still be meat options on the menu yes there is there's a, there's always meat options there is one day that we're there the week where we do a, a vegetarian menu um but for people who are hardened meat eaters we can always um you know cook cook a chicken breast for someone but um what we're trying to do is we have we you know, we we spend a lot of time creating a, a menu that's pretty incredible and we're trying to show off the 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 a wide variety of uh, vegetables and uh, plant-based um dishes and we find that most of the time on that day where we we do a kind of meat-free day guests often come away saying it was their favorite meal of the week um so each it's it's, it's a kind of important part of, of what we're doing is to try and reduce the overall meat content by you know showing off the best part of plant-based eating as possible yeah well i mean I would say that that seems to be a good policy uh, to me because I read lots of statistics about what people's intentions are and how they want to be more sustainable. And reducing the amount of meat they eat is a key uh, part of that. It's also one of the most achievable ones. And these days, uh, I don't think it's that unusual to have a, you know, a meatless uh, meal, whereas back in the kind of original d- days of chalets, it was would be very uh, considered quite uh, uh, unusual or even odd to be uh, selecting a vegetarian meal whereas these days it's kind of standard there's so many meat substitutes available on the market that most people wouldn't even know there's actually a cafe a a vegan cafe near to me down here which i go to on a fairly regular basis and they do a blt sandwich and i almost feel guilty because it tastes and smells exactly like bacon (laughs) it's not uh it's not bacon it's amazing i wondered if i could ask you another question you mentioned the hot tub there so you can there's a possibility of getting a discount if you opt out of using the hot tub and this is something that doesn't really get mentioned much within the uh, ski industry it's often used as a selling point but i've always you know wondered about the hot tub it uses a lot of water and a lot of electricity to uh, to keep it going i wondered if you could give any insight into that well, yeah, like you said, you know, it does use a lot of um, energy. Um, keeping water heated to thirty-seven and a half degrees when it's minus twenty outside is, you know, it requires some power. Um, and in addition to that, you know, we've had a. Well, in fact, we are still in a drought, the top level drought crisis that you can be in still in france now and so 1500 liters of water being flushed down the drains um each week it seems indulgent um in 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 the in the climate in which we're living in so we're trying to incentivize people to uh consider you know using not using the hot tub and we're trying to give a you know generous discount to people to to help incentivize that 
Okay, and are there any? You mentioned the drought. I'm aware that other areas of France are more badly affected than the Haute uh, Savoie, where you are. But are there any regulations in place about water use at the moment? Well, at the moment, yeah, you're not allowed to fill hot tubs. Um, the expectation is that will be lifted as of the 31st of August, but that's been in place now. So, 31st of October, it's now been in place since august so it will be a good three months that we are having to live with this um so you're not allowed to wash your car you're not allowed to fill your hot tub or your swimming pool um and the various other parts of that regulation um but we're hoping that we've had good rain in the last couple of weeks and i think by the end of october that will be lifted Right. OK, well, that's really interesting as well. And something else that you mentioned to me before we started uh, the live conversation just now is that you're also offering your guests uh, an opportunity to offset their flights if they fly out, uh, you know, rather than taking the train or uh, or driving this winter. Yeah, sure. So we've we worked hard on um, trying to reduce the impact of our operations um, over the last few years, but somewhere between 50 and 75 percent of the carbon emissions associated with the with the ski holiday come from the travel to and from resorts this is what we're now trying to do now that we've kind of reduced the impact of our operations as much as possible we're trying to now help our guests reduce the impact of getting to and from resorts so we've done a we've introduced a voluntary um carbon neutrality contribution which is around nine euros what well, is nine euros per person and that basically would offset the average emissions associated with traveling from a European city to Geneva and then a minibus up to Morzine and back. Clients can choose to opt out of that if they want to. Yeah, it's entirely voluntary. And if they feel like they've traveled further and they'd like to pay a bit more, they can do that too. And then 100% of the proceeds go to Foundation Good Planet, which is a um, which invests in projects that offset carbon uh, in various places around the world. OK, excellent. Well, I, I've touched on um, offsetting before uh, during my conversation with uh, Helen Coffey. That's a separate podcast that you can uh, uh, listen to. That That's brilliant, Al. Um, really enjoyed talking to you uh, about that. And I wish you all the best uh, for this winter. And I'll be really interested to hear, uh, you know, when it comes towards the end of the season, what the take up was from your guests in relation to the to the offsetting and whether how many uh, of your guests actually opted to, you know, get that discount by taking the green or options sure i'd be delighted yeah absolutely cool all right that's great thanks very much for your time today and we'll speak to you again soon cheers Ian. right so that was really interesting to hear from uh, al and i'll continue to uh, include as many kind of sustainability pieces in the podcast as i can because i'm always really interested in that and what different people are doing within the industry now we're going to move to close now i enjoy all feedback about the show uh, please do review us on spotify or uh, apple or get in contact on social media or by email the ski podcast at gmail.com We've had a couple of uh, reviews on Apple Podcasts recently. User Fogey58 said, always varied, well presented, and for snow sport fans, an essential hit. Uh, Guapo333 said, love this podcast, really informative and superbly presented. Keep up the good work, Ian. Thank you very much. I also had an email in from, no idea how to pronounce this, it's uh, Gaelic Fiacra Diskin who's uh, from a company called Mountain People in uh, Ireland. Uh, also, Dave Waller on Twitter and Lane Bunyan on LinkedIn uh, all said a great podcast. Elaine also said she really enjoyed the last podcast and Greece is now on her bucket list. If you didn't listen to the last podcast, uh, make sure you have a listen to that because we had Gemma Bowes on talking about her recent trip to Greece. Now, don't forget, we have 156 other episodes as well as this one to catch up on. And typically around 75 to 100 of them get listened to every week. You can follow me at Skipedia and the podcast at the Ski Podcast. Uh, but for now, I'd like to thank uh, Le Trois Valley, the Three Valleys, for sponsoring the show and thank my guest today, Luke. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thanks for having me. And Sam, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ian. And finally, listener, thank you for joining us. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>